Uh, Ms. McLeod is absent this evening due to a work obligation. And uh, moving on to school board administrative matters real quick. Uh, we have two adjustments to our agenda this evening. Um, that we will, if there's no um, objection. The first one is the addition of policy 7-21 regarding community relations, which most of you have, all of you have a copy of it in front of you. Um, the policy committee met yesterday to discuss and revise the wording and criteria for this policy so that we could put it on our information part of the agenda this evening. Um, and you may have some questions about it, but you can direct them um, to the policy committee during this next two weeks. Uh, the other adjustment is to move item B from consent to action D. Mr. Edwards has asked for that to be moved to action so that we can get a short briefing about it and uh, get some further questions. Are there any other? Um, can you repeat that was the last one? one? Um, to move item B from consent agenda to action D. Um, it has to do with okay. the um, the allocation of land okay. there at John B. Dye. Is that right, Mr. Edwards? Yeah, it's. That's fine. We've been burned once on that. I just like to make sure we're not. Okay, and um, to my knowledge, we do not have a closed session this evening. So. <laughs> any other announcements, quick? So we've already kept our people waiting. I think we're also going to flip. Right now, um, and we're going to do the green run um, right. workshop now in, instead of last. That is correct, and that is because we do have guests. And to kick us off and get us started, uh, Daniel Keever. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Anderson, Vice Chair Edwards, board members, and Dr. Spence. It's our pleasure to join you this afternoon and share the terrific work that is taking place at Green Run High School as their team is in the implementation year of the Virginia Department of Education High School Innovation Grant Program. Mr. Tarkenton, principal at Green Run, and a talented group of teachers and students from the school will provide a majority of our presentation today. We feel sure that you'll be impressed with the various facets of the programming at Green Run. In setting the context for the workshop, please allow me to briefly share some overview thoughts. Assisting with the overview will be Dr. James Pohl, the Executive Director for Secondary Teaching and Learning. Our goal is to quickly help set the stage for the Green Run team and then rejoin the group at the end to respond to questions from the board. On the slide before you, you will see a number of graphic representations for the work of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Our strategic framework comes to 2020 to include our core values, the teaching and learning framework, dispositions related to transformational learning, and of course, our graduate profile. The concepts and philosophies within these items has served to ground and guide the work of high school principals during the last several years, as we have sought to challenge our thinking around the high school experience. Indeed, this has been a focus area for school divisions around the Commonwealth and certainly throughout the country. While the typical high school experience may work and be effective for some students, it is clear that our current model doesn't work for all students. Since the 15-16 school year, high school leaders have been meeting, <coughs> visioning, and working with our respective communities or with their respective communities to better understand what's needed. These dialogue sessions led to the formulation of smaller work groups, visits by school-based teams to other high schools around the state, and earnest internal school conversations to include the principal, administrative teams, teacher leaders, and most importantly, in some cases, student voices. Guided by Compass 2020, specifically goal one, high academic expectations, goal two, multiple pathways, and goal three, social emotional development, along with the graduate profile, the principals have explored several redesign efforts. As an example, each of our high schools is currently using an advisory period. This year, our school is committed to having 11 advisory period sessions. These are commonly scheduled across the school division. In our research on rethinking the high school experience, we found that many schools are turning to advisory periods and mentoring programs as a way to ensure that, that each student is known well by at least one adult in the building, an adult to whom the student can turn for help with both academic <coughs> and personal issues. The purpose is to personalize school in order to better meet the needs of our students. While our advisory program is a work in progress, we've been generally pleased with the feedback on the initial sessions thus far. 
Moving forward, Dr. Cole and members of his team will help the schools create an overarching curriculum framework. Additionally, a number of our high schools are experimenting with daily schedules that could provide for better use of time. For instance, there's been some testing of an idea called One Lunch, which we discovered on a visit to Deep Run High School. This concept allows for an extended lunch period for all students during which they can receive additional academic assistance, they can attend a club meeting, uh, perhaps meet with a school counselor, take a makeup assessment, visit the library media center, or simply work on homework. Each of our high schools took a team of staff to visit Deep Run this fall to better understand the logistics involved. While this concept is still in the design phase, there's been positive feedback to the idea of getting away from a locked in four by 30 minute lunch period during third block that we feel like limits our schedule flexibility. Moving forward, we intend to share more with this concept later in the school year. I'd like to call on Dr. Paul to offer, offer some information on innovative course collaborations happening in our schools. Dr. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Keever. As we continue looking at various ways to innovate and recreate the high school experience, we have been working with teachers and principals on a smaller scale to create content and curriculum that is then replicable across the division. Currently, the Department of Teaching and Learning is working to support teachers at Kellum, Lansdowne, and Ocean Lakes High Schools who have an interest in combining courses with natural connections and learning and standards that allow for more authentic opportunities to apply the content. Teachers and administrators at each of these schools have been collaborating since last spring to identify specific courses and to plan learning activities that support standards that connect these courses. Currently, we have students enrolled in combined sections of Algebra 1 with Earth Science, Biology with Health and Physical Education 9, Honors English 10 with AP European History, AP English 12 with Government, as well as World History 1 with English 9. Students were purposefully scheduled into both classes to ensure they have the teachers who are planning together. Each of the combined courses has two teachers, one certified in each subject area, that work together on planning and implementing instruction. The combined courses are also scheduled over the necessary two blocks of time to allow the students the time needed for learning the content. Again, the goal of this work is to start on a smaller level rather than create whole-scale division-wide changes to find <clears throat> successes in the work and replicate the curriculum changes across the division that have been designed and successfully implemented with these smaller groups of teachers. Thank you for allowing us the brief time to connect the context or create the context of the presentation for Green Run. When they conclude, we'll be happy to address questions as a group. At this time, it brings me great pleasure to introduce and welcome the principal of Green Run High School, Mr. Todd Parkinson. Thank you, Dr. Pohl, and good afternoon. Again, my name is Todd Tarkenton, and I am the proud <coughs> principal of Green Run High School. This incredible journey began for us back in July of 2016, when we were awarded one of the Virginia Department of Education's High School Program Innovation Planning Grants. Included in your packet is a press release explaining the details of this grant. However, the reason the BDOE created this grant was to allow innovation to happen at the individual school level and develop programs that are replicable across the Commonwealth. These were strategically offered to be programs being planned that met the goals within the BDOE profile of a graduate. This $50,000 grant helped us explore ways to create more innovative learning opportunities for our students. These grant funds were designated for planning purposes only and not for programmatic needs. The goals of the grant included improving student academic performance and the on-time graduation rate, while also providing teachers with professional development to more effectively engage students in rigorous coursework. With this in mind, we selected certain teachers that had demonstrated success in working with students with varied academic abilities and social-emotional needs. These teachers spent many hours this past spring and summer preparing unique, engaging, and experiential learning opportunities. <clears throat> they worked with the Department of Teaching and Learning and learned from the work of experts in this field. The teachers decided to name this new learning venture the Innovation <coughs> Lab. During the spring and summer, the teachers visited our feeder middle schools, Plaza and Larkspur, <coughs> to share this exciting new opportunity with our rising ninth graders. We held parent information nights and explained the overarching purpose of the Innovation Lab. <coughs> From these meetings, 
A group of students and their parents chose to explore this new learning experience. The group is well balanced, with approximately 50% from each of the two <laughs> meter middle schools represented. 55% of the cohort is female. The ethnic makeup of the students within the innovation lab also mirrors that of the student body as a whole, with 42% African American, 30% Caucasian, 13% Hispanic, and 13% identifying as two or more races. 13% also receive special education services. Finally, with all of the new innovative ideas <coughs> that the teachers have created for this amazing group of students, we were extremely excited when the VDOE awarded Green Run a second $50,000 program innovation implementation grant so that we can continue the curriculum development for the following years and also be able to visit other innovation programs around the country to gather more ideas. At this time, we would like to introduce to you some of the teachers and students of the iLab. Mr. Jacobs. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Tarkington. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Jacobs, and I'm the current lead teacher and coordinator of the Green Run High School Innovation Lab. In this presentation today, we hope to capture the exciting and liberating work of the iLab and offer you insight from our current teachers and students. From its inception, the iLab has been a labor of love with a mission to help our students at Green Run find their purpose and a place in the world. With seven teachers from nearly every department in the building, plus the librarian, we began to work on a set of core values and beliefs in the spring of 2017 that captured the spirit of innovation and applied the VBCPS goals as defined in our strategic framework of Compass 20 to 20. Gathering research from around the world, input from students, and using the real world, real time classroom experience of our Green Run teachers, we developed the following guiding principles for our work. <clears throat> we take students, the things they love, and their natural abilities seriously and aim to build learning around student passions every day. We believe in intrinsic motivation and rigorous self-analysis. We believe learning should be as fun as humanly possible. We have a saying in the iLab that if we are not having fun, then we must be doing something wrong. We believe in creating and maintaining a positive and safe learning environment with uplifting peer and teacher relationships. We believe failure can be a crucial step on the road to success, and we aim to fail forward. We believe social and emotional learning and developing personal ethics are as important as academic trainings. With these guidelines in place, the Green Run High School Innovation Lab welcomed our first class, the class of 2021, to Green Run High School. And there they are. Although we have only been together for a few months, due to the structures in place in the iLab, the learning experiences we have shared, the hard work of the teachers, the hope of their parents, the incredible flexibility and support of our administrative team, and the willingness of our students to adapt and challenge themselves in new ways, the iLab is up and running with a strong sense of belonging and family. Now we would like to provide you all with a synopsis of how it all works in the iLab at Green Run. And then we're going to break it down part by part through teachers and students' <coughs> perspectives. The three pillars of the iLab are learning expeditions, social and emotional learning, and multidisciplinary learning. With these learning expeditions, we get our students out of the building to tap into the wisdom and experiences our community has to offer. We also bring the community into Green Run High School through our community conversations, where alumni, business leaders, authors, and many others come in to speak with our students and share real-time job scenarios, projects, and personal experiences. The second pillar of the iLab is social and emotional learning. We seek to develop non-cognitive skills in our students and ourselves through daily practice, discussion, and role-playing. We embrace learning opportunities which sometimes push us out of our comfort zones, like zip lining through trees at the Adventure Park on the very first day of school. And we work on things that help us to become active listeners, encouraging and supportive classmates and diligent students. The third pillar of the Green Run High School iLab is multidisciplinary learning. Our curricula is built organically each month based on innovative practices, VDOE subject standards and frameworks, student passions, student strengths <coughs> and weaknesses, and current events. And it infuses technological help from around the world through Khan Academy, exploring this uh, by the seat of your pants and other organizations. Most of our work is then housed in the Schoology platform and the students' Google Drive. With a general introduction completed, 
let me please introduce you now to some of our iLab teachers and students to further explain the iLab experience. Desiree Cooper, our iLab World Geography teacher, will discuss expeditionary learning in more detail. Um, in the iLab, we get into the world as often as we can to explore it and experience it. Our learning expeditions have taken us to the Appalachian Mountains, the University of Virginia, the Aquarium, and the Adventure Park, the National Golf Course in Virginia Beach, Bayville Park, Stumpy Lake, the Salvation Army, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and just down the street to Green Run Elementary School. We are dreaming of visiting multiple, multiple national parks over the next four years and exploring new places based on our students' passions and interests. As we explore these places, not only do we expand our knowledge of the world, but we have a ton of fun doing it, which creates a strong sense of belonging and connection to school. And now Cliff Atkinson, the iLab biology teacher, will share the experiences of our UVA learning expedition. After getting out of our comfort zone, climbing to the top of humpback rocks, we gained practical insights and inspiration <coughs> while touring UVA's campus. We learned about the admissions process and toured UVA's library and technology lab. We made connections with new people and places and talked about finding the right balance in our lives between technology and the natural world. Next, you will hear from Carrie Sabo, our innovation and entrepreneurship instructor, to explain how when we get out, of, out into the community, when we can't get out into the community, we bring the community into the eye lab. <clears throat> community conversations are powerful learning experiences for our students, teachers, and guest speakers. During the first nine weeks, we averaged about one speaker per week. We asked our guests to share their work and education journeys their setbacks, obstacles, successes, and their real-world scenarios with our students. Mm -hmm. We also ask the speakers to connect to our social and emotional theme of the week. Usually the speaker will, will share about 20 minutes, then we open it up for questions from our students. The students actively take notes during the conversations and reflect on what they learned and how they can apply those lessons to their own lives. One of our iLab students, Ruth Fleet, <coughs> is here to share what she's gained from this part of the iLab experience. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of what I have learned <coughs> so far with the iLab community conversations. My favorite learning experience is attorney Amanda Gregory. Since she's a prosecuting attorney, she had a lot of interesting stories to tell. She also brought new aspects of the law by showing us how even laws that people protest against to help protect us. Miss Gregory shared parts of her personal history with us that related to why she chose her current job. She spoke about passing the bar and what motivates her to work so hard. Miss Gregory is a Green Run graduate and seeing her achieve her dreams of going to law school and being an attorney was very inspiring. Now I would like to introduce you to Miss Bridget Berthold, our health and PE teacher in the iLab, she will discuss the social and emotional learning aspect of the iLab. Many of our students are in need of more than just subject content knowledge. They need skills and strengths to help them navigate through tough economic times and family situations. The turbulence of the teenage years, the intensity of social media, and the rapidly changing world in general. In the iLab, we embed social and emotional learning in everything we do, and we personalize it to our students' circumstances. Situations arise each day where our students and our teachers have to put into practice skills and strengths such as conflict resolution, growth, set, growth mindset, empathy, courage, and active listening. Some of the structures and SEL themes of our iLab are as follows, and we will have another iLab student, Malachi Gilliam, introduce them to you. During the first nine weeks, we had lessons in life and lessons from the lives of others. The ones that stand out to me that I'm putting into practice are you must take risks and you must get out of your comfort zone. I also learned about the importance of running with the right crowd and changing your mindset. I learned a lot from the lives of Malcolm X and Andrew Jackson. 
I couldn't believe that Malcolm X learned every word in the dictionary. I also learned about bouncing back from losing people in your life like Andrew Jackson did when he lost his mom, brother, adopted son, and wife. The iLab is helping to show me I need to be on top of my schoolwork so I can reach my goals. Now here's Ms. Scoville, our English iLab instructor, to share the last pillar of the iLab, multi, multidisciplinary learning. Thank you, Malachi. As noted in the quote from Sir Ken Robinson, a leader in creative and cultural education, one of our main concepts is to blend everything in the iLab. Technology, biology, innovation, English, world geography, and even PE. Due to the flexibility of our scheduling and our collaborative planning time, we are able to build lessons that are not isolated, but integrate all of our subject matters. And we are able to team teach many of these lessons together. For example, a few weeks ago, we had a Skype session with an Arctic explorer, Jill Heinrich. In preparation for this session, we studied the geography of Canada, Greenland, and the Northern Hemisphere. The students researched plants and animals from these regions in biology and learned how life finds a way in even the coldest regions of the world. They then reflected in writing what they had learned and what questions they still had. This past week, we turned a look, took a learning expedition to our first national park in North Carolina, the Wright Brothers Memorial and Jockey's Ridge State Park. The students researched the Wright brothers and learned how they fought with each other and pushed each other to take risks. <coughs> they learned about pitch, yaw, and roll dynamics on planes, submarines, and satellites. And they learned about the animals and plants that find a way to survive in the biggest sand dunes east of the Mississippi River. They also got an awesome workout for PE as they hiked up the dunes, taking over 16,000 steps. The beauty of the North Carolina expedition is that it was dreamed up and then planned and organized by Ruth and three of her classmates. In closing, here's Mr. Jacobs again to discuss the iLab daily structures and our vision going forward. So here's what our schedule looks like on paper, but in reality, we are able to move students throughout the day based on abilities, progress, desires, and individual needs. We are able to truly differentiate based on where each student is, say on their passion project research, or their disease uh, project presentation, or their progress in Khan Academy, biology, SOL preparation. Our students stay together all three blocks with the same teachers on A day, which gives us flexibility to take learning expeditions without missing other classes. Our students can go mentor at one of our feeder elementary schools and not miss math or football practice after school. On B days, students have the flexibility to take electives in the morning, then they are with us in the iLab for the last two blocks of the day. Innovation and entrepreneurship and health PE is where they spend that time with us. And because we all teach together, we can differentiate here too. Students have the choice for a high-intensity workout with Coach B, a slow and steady fitness program through walking around campus with Ms. Sabo, or team sports like flag football and kickball with me. It also gives us the flexibility to have Freedom Fridays, where the students are able to choose what they want to do during the last hour of the day, which in this case was checking out the latest virtual reality tools. Going forward, here's what we envision for our next iLab class and the class of 2022. If you look at the class of 22 coming in next year, a new group of ninth graders, they'll be taking honors English 9, Biology and World Geography, three blocks of blended learning. The class of 2021, the class of Malachi and the class of Ruth, they'll be um, moving up as sophomores and they'll be taking English 10 honors and some uh, regular English 10, AP Environmental <coughs> Science, and Virginia U.S. Government. Again, three blocks of blended learning. And they also have the freedom to take their uh, electives. They'll also be taking health and PE and economics and finance uh, with two blocks of blended learning. And in the years ahead, our initial class of 2021 
will continue as follows, with other iLab classes taking a similar route. As juniors, they will take English 11, uh, and they'll take, again, honors, or they could take AP or regular, and Virginia U.S. history. It'll be two blocks of blended learning. They'll have plenty of time for their electives and also have opportunities to explore internships, job shadowing, dual enrollment courses at TCC, ATC, and the Tech Center. And then finally, as they progress through their senior year, they'll have their regular course requirements, knocking out all their math. They'll have a leadership course uh, with us. It'll be one block, and they'll have their English 12 options. And then again, on B-Day, they have opportunities to explore internships, job shadowing, dual enrollment at TCC, ATC, and the Tech Center. So the idea is to really free their schedule up during their junior and senior year to get out to the community and to build on some of those relationships that have formed during their uh, freshman and sophomore years. So one of the, the hidden beauties of the iLab is that the students do stay together for four years. Uh, with some of the same iLab teachers, they will progress through high school. And this creates what we hope will be lifelong friendships. Friendships with each other and a support network to help them reach their career and life goals and to find their purpose. Students will work together and be guided through the academic and career planning process on a regular basis with their teachers and school counselors to assist them in choosing the best path for them after high school. Another pleasant surprise that we found already in just one nine weeks as a school and as individual teachers is how many of our structures and ideas and practices are spreading through the school and how numerous teachers are asking us how they can get involved in the iLab or to do something similar. It is a great way to invigorate teachers and to inspire students. Thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to present to you what's going on at the Green Run High School Innovation Lab. And we'd love for you guys to check us out on Twitter. We've done a day-by-day -day history of the iLab with our Twitter account at Green Run High School iLab. And you can see photos from uh, the first 53 days of the iLab so far. And we'd love for you to, uh, to follow us there. Mr. Kieber. As you've heard from the fantastic students and teachers at Green Run, they are invigorated by their work in the iLab. Uh, we're grateful for their willingness to serve as pioneers with regard to redesigned high school experiences. In the next several weeks, we'll share an invitation uh, through Ms. Alexander with you, which would invite you out to the school to take a look at the iLab program. Hope you'll take advantage of this opportunity and see the experience firsthand. At this time, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. We'd call folks forward, and I'll try to direct it to the right person. Any questions, Mr. Edwards? Um, wow. Okay. It's, right. almost, it's almost too good to be true, so my first question has to be, <laughs> is this allocation neutral? You, you want to start with the easy questions? Or we, we? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, it's so good. It's like, can we replicate this? That's, so allocation. One of the things that Dr. Cole said during his opening was that we were, we were attempting to start small so that we can then broaden the, the, the scenario. There is There are partial allocations which are a part of the iLab that we've been able to utilize through the, the general allocation process. Ms. Riggs? So uh, you might have said it, but I, there was so much. Um, how are the students chosen to be? It was an open opportunity for any of the students who, coming up from Plaza or Larkspur, had expressed an interest. Uh, the original grant had indicated that if there was a large number, the original grant had indicated 100 students, and we were planning to have an open lottery for students. Again, it was intended only for Greenwood High School zone students coming up from our feeder middle schools. But as such, through our information nights, and again, being brand new, um, and then also through research, we realized a smaller scale might be more appropriate. And so um, the 57 that originally expressed interest, we felt was a perfect number for us to start with. So you went out to the, that was the part of yes. going out to the yes. schools. So we okay. reached out to our members. Gotcha. Ms. <coughs> Melnick. Um, so for those of us that attended the Virginia School Board Conference in Williamsburg last week and listened to the speakers, um, every speaker said, if this isn't where you're going, Right. You're going to be playing catch up for a yeah. long period of time. Right. And the fact that you're already here is amazing. Kudos to you all. Great work. This is really, really wonderful. Um, Ms. Manning. 
Um, I love the idea about the learning expeditions. Um, how often do you do you take those learning expeditions, and uh, are those done during the school week? Are they doing, done on weekends? How does that work? So we have been doing them during the school week. We did uh, several during the summer, uh, so we were able to you know get the kids, and it was it was a uh, organizational nightmare to try to make that happen um, before they even came to high school. But it it paid dividends, and it's already working out so well. So we did several during the summer, and then so far we're probably averaging maybe two a month, I guess, is about where we're at. And so because of the scheduling, we are able to go during the iLab classes so they don't miss their other classes. Um, and so, you know, we've gone fishing at Stumpy Lake for PE, and, you know, we've gone to um, Bayville Park to work with biology and they're identifying trees, but at the same time they're having fun and playing frisbee golf as well. And so we're really blending them. And we've been keeping the um, prices very, very low um, just by calling in favors and doing everything that we possibly can to make, to make that work. Um, and, and, and finding cool free things to do as well. So when we went to the National Park, for instance, last week, um, down at the, the Wright Brothers Memorial, Miss Sabo called and said, look, I, I got a group of 57 kids here that really want to see this place, and can we get in? And we're talking to the park ranger there, and all I know is we go on in, you know? <laughs> um, and the same thing at the, at the state park. And then when we went to Jeanette Pier, Mr. Atkinson called the guy before we got there, and he says, listen, we've got 57 kids who really would love to see your pier and your aquariums. And, and he said, absolutely, come on. Yeah. You know, it's about exploration. So, you know, when people find out about it, they're, they're really willing to help out. Nice. So. Yeah. Just to follow up right. to Ms. the, the wait, 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 just a minute. Miss Rye, I think, is next. Miss Rye. Oh, go ahead. I think it's in this department in question. So for the next round, will you just wait to see what the interest level is? You're going to keep open-minded about that in terms of numbers? Well, and we believe that the success has been attributed to the numbers that were more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to blend those three courses together, yeah. obviously having, you know, class sizes that would be akin to what a regular, you know, block would appear to be like. So we see the number being about the same. 60 was our cap this year and so uh, we, we, the teachers feedback as well has been that that number is about right. And then just a comment that this traces back to uh, in my home state when my kids were in elementary <coughs> school this was on date a few decades ago but the whole language you know was, it had just come on the scene that whole concept of integrated subject learning and I always wondered at the high school level you know the challenge was the size of our of, of a larger high school setting and kids taking different courses and so it's interesting to see how this can still work out within that setting. Ms. Ricks? Just to follow up to the outings, you said that um, like going fishing in Slumpy Lake was during the PE time, but going obviously going to the Wright Brothers is a longer time, so how do you work that? So on A day, they're with us second, third, and fourth block, and so that begins roughly about 9 o'clock. So they went to their math class, and then at 9 o'clock they met us. We got the yellow buses out, and we rolled to North Carolina. It took us about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, that trip, because we were doing so much, we said we'll have to be back at 6.30 in the evening, and so we met, the parents met us up at school so we could have the afternoon as well as the time in school. Okay. Ms. Holtz. Uh, thank you. Um, you said that the group stays together, but what about core subjects like math? Do they blend in with the school population? Yes, ma'am. Um, because the students may be on various levels of math, we right. want to make sure that we're still continuing to make sure that's a focus uh, for our students and for the school as well. Um, so, yes, they have their own unique blocks, so they would be with the other ninth grade students or whatever grade level it may be with the math course that they are registered for coming up from eighth grade. So you have a, you have a, I'm trying to understand this. Sure. Do you have a special core of teachers that teach just this group in the iLab? Or, is or the English world geography and biology, you've met those three teachers this evening, but for the math department, while we encourage okay. collaboration okay. across the faculty, those teachers recognize that these are all ninth grade students for Greenland High School when they have them in their math classes. So, and when these students graduate, their graduation diploma, does it have anything significant on it that this is different? <laughs> no. 
No, ma'am. This is intended to be something that we would like to replicate around the division in terms of instructional practice. We think this is best for all students, okay. and so we're trying to really, you know, cultivate it at, at a smaller scale at Green Run, demonstrate the successes that we can have, uh, both socially and academically, so that everyone else can get on board eventually. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Edwards. The, uh, <clears throat> you got this wonderfully blended group of students through chance the 57 that apply. I mean, that's really cool. I would think that next year, if the word gets out, you'll be significantly oversubscribed and we'll allow you to then like ensure to ensure you sustain that kind of a, of a, of a mix, which is yes. what I think you have to do. I, I hope you're in the long run grooming a new a whole new breed of master schedulers to try to make something <laughs> like this work. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you had any inquiries in, from other high schools in our division? There have been conversations, obviously, at our league meetings. Um, you know, uh, they're obviously interested in coming by. We've had a few schools come by and, and, and visit, as we would encourage you to stop by as well. We'll send you out some invitation dates, uh, as well as other school divisions that have sought to come out and take a look. Thank you. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. How does the scale beyond this beyond 60 students in a cohort? Like, what is the need? We talked about partial allocations to sort of make this work now, but like, what what in general? Like, if you were to just flip a switch next year and say all Greenland High School is going to do this, like, what what would be the needs beyond what you're being given now? I think that's I think that's hard to say, uh, and I, I don't think as we as we experiment this year, I don't think we're in a position to say how you would take it across the whole school or let alone all of our high schools. Uh, one of the one of the neat processes is to see it unfold this year and then attempt to replicate it even better next year. And, and I think that as we build this out, we'll have some better ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> We're doing a couple of different, we didn't have talk about, but we are doing that's a couple of different. I lab that they, no, 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 but we do have across a couple of different high schools and in interdisciplinary yeah. courses that, that we've been working on over the summer. So next item on our uh, workshop is the uh, update on Compass 2020, both goal number three. We will, in the interest of time, turn it right over to Dr. Caswell. All right. Good evening, Chairperson Anderson, Vice Chair Edwards, Dr. Spence, and school board members. This workshop will provide as its title an update on Compass 2020 Goal 3 and related <coughs> strategies, as well as an update on progress on some of those strategies. So first, a reminder of Goal 3, which states that all students will benefit from an educational experience that fosters their social and emotional development, and what an outstanding example of that we just saw within the Green Run Innovation Program that blends both that academic and social, social emotional piece. Um, so I think of Company 2020 setting that purpose for the entire school division, just to set some context about what we mean by social emotional learning. Social emotional learning generally refers to the skills and abilities that allow individuals to relate to others, set goals, manage emotions, and resolve conflicts. So while all strategies are being pursued in service of goal three for this presentation, I'm gonna share with you efforts specifically around strategy four. You'll notice that strategy four calls out three specific actions which involve working to build capacity in our schools in regard to the student response team process, the practice of mediation, and the implementation of the PBIS framework. In this presentation, I'll outline the work that's been done to date in each three, each of these three areas. 
As schools and central office teams collaborate in these areas, we're working to create a support or bridge the gap, if you will, to better meet student social and emotional needs. This presentation will look at each of these three areas and how they're currently being approached at the school level. Let's start with a look at the student response team process. <coughs> so what, what is a student response team, you might be wondering. It's a proactive, systematic approach which uses interventions and strategies to continually monitor and track student progress over time. Students may be referred when they're experiencing academic or behavioral difficulties. Adjustments are made by the team to instructional or behavioral programs for students to ensure their success. The process leverages universal screenings and progress monitoring. The process involves the implementation of the multi-tiered system, as you can see on the screen, which provides a framework for differentiated high quality instruction. Student response team membership may vary depending on the issue at hand and typically consists of the parent, a school administrator, teachers, the school counselor, and other related staff, such as a social worker or psychologist. Students may also be included in the process depending on maturation and the issue at hand. To ensure a consistent, structured implementation of student response teams, all schools were asked during the 16-17 school year to move from a student support team model to a student response model. The biggest difference here is that the support team model was often a reactive process, while the student response process is proactive and focuses on tier one interventions in all classrooms and then through the student response team leverages tier two and three interventions in response to students needs and monitors progress reconvening to discuss progressive interventions as needed. Again, this school year through our strategic action agenda, all schools who had not fully implemented were asked to come fully on board of course, with great support from the central level. Part of relationship building, as is done with student response teams, is recognizing when students need help, de-escalating and implementing strategies to help them resolve conflicts <clears throat> and to modify behaviors before they rise to the level of a larger discipline issue. In some instances, mediation is one strategy that can be used. This year's strategic action agenda includes a commitment to building a stronger understanding of the mediation process and how to leverage the process when appropriate to resolve conflicts between teachers and students. The Department of Teaching and Learning, in partnership with staff from the Student Leadership Office, offered professional learning this summer for school counselors and other select staff. We also provided a mediation overview session for all administrators this fall. An important component of that training was explaining what mediation is and why we would use it in our schools. As noted on the slide, mediation is a flexible process which can be used proactively and reactively. A teacher may request mediation when he or she notes a situation has the potential to escalate in an attempt to restore or build a stronger relationship between the student and the teacher or mediation may be requested in conjunction with a discipline incident in order to get to the root of the cause of a related conflict and ensure lasting <coughs> resolution. Mediation exists and has for years within our discipline guidelines as a level three intervention. Mediation is not simply a conference after an incident or a conflict. Mediation is actually a structured process to be conducted by a trained mediator. It is not appropriate for all situations. While it's a highly flexible process, it works best when both parties are willing participants and are open to the process. In fact, some have mistakenly had the perception that mediation is to be used instead of other disciplinary consequences. While mediation certainly may be used before discipline occurs or after a discipline incident occurs, it is not intended to be used in place of other consequences for specific infractions as outlined in the VBCPS discipline guidelines and our student code of conduct. At a recent citywide principals meeting, an overview on the process of mediation was provided and this allowed administrators time to examine scenarios and determine whether mediation may or may not be an effective strategy to use in the given scenario. Principals were then asked to reflect on their learning and understanding as a result of the session. On the screen, please note some of their reflections. 
<clears throat> so as you can see, as a result of the training, this really helped our school teams to be able to leverage a practice that had always been listed, but they may not have known when to appropriately use it or how to appropriately use it. While all of our schools are using the student response team process and are exploring mediation practices to meet student needs, we also have a number of schools working on implementing the PBIS framework. You may recall that last school year we had 19 schools serving as PBIS schools. These original PBIS schools began the work over the course of the past few years through grant funding that was made available to the division. This school year, the division brought a new cohort of 19 schools on board to PBIS. Designated staff from the Office of Psychological Services have also joined the PBIS team, serving as PBIS coaches to support all of our PBIS schools who are continuing the journey and are also <coughs> new to the PBIS journey. So what is the work that PBIS schools are engaging in? Well, PBIS, which is, by the way, known as many acronyms, you may hear PBIS, MTSS, or VTSS, depending on the origin of the work, but they're all referring to the same framework. Um, so PBIS is not an intervention or a strategy. It's a framework that provides a structure for schools to develop a culture and behavioral supports to meet the needs of all students. Since many of our schools are deeply involved in this work, Rather than you hearing from me regarding PBIS, I wanted you to have an opportunity to hear directly um, from our schools and bring some of their voices and perspectives regarding PBIS to you this evening. So let's hear how some of our PBIS schools define the PBIS framework. Well, I think PBIS is a method to look at discipline in a different kind of way. Um, we definitely still incorporate the negative consequences as well that they shouldn't be doing, unfortunately, you know, there will have to be an A or a B. But the aspect of PBIS that I think is new that we introduced to Virginia Beach is the idea of teaching positive behavior as well. So when a student does something well, we acknowledge it because essentially the definition of discipline is to teach, but we don't want to just teach poor behaviors, we want to teach positive ones. Uh, so PBIS, um, I think it gets kind of a bad rap. I think a lot of people think that PBIS is just about incentives. It's about something flashy. It's about things that are tangible, you know, having a great reward or having like raffle tickets or acknowledging behavior. I think a lot of people assume that it is ignoring discipline and is actually just in fact about, you know, some fluffy acknowledgement system like Kacha being good. But at its core, it's a lot deeper than that. Um, PBIS is Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. It's kind of another acronym in the alphabet soup of education, but it has a lot of meaning. Um, at, at its core, essentially, PBIS is about having um, expectations created by the faculty and by students and by community, and having um, these expectations enforced consistently in a building, having them explicitly taught, and having consistent and very well-defined uh, consequences for when you meet those expectations and when you don't meet those expectations. teachers, PBIS is not a CANT program, but rather a common framework individualized to each school. It's a preventative and proactive approach to behavior. In speaking with staff at <coughs> PBIS schools about their journey, they share that there are often misconceptions or myths about PBIS that they've worked to dispel as they were implementing the framework. For example, one of those myths is that PBIS is a magic bullet of sorts and upon implementation, discipline problems are immediately reduced. Let's hear from teachers in two of our PBIS schools who explain this misconception. You know, PBIS is a process and it does not happen overnight. It takes, it's, this is our third year. And I can say after 15 years of teaching that this was the first year, going into our third year, that the start of school went so smooth and I think really it's because those systems of support have been laid, you know, two years ago and students know what the school-wide expectations are, the language, and it allowed for us as teachers to just dive right into teaching and learning a lot faster than spending time teaching rules, routines, procedures, and, and you know, PBIS, teaching these systems of support, there's, there's a lot less disruption in the classroom and we're able to, to 
facilitate a lot more teaching and learning than we would have in the past. From the first year, you know, it was kind of, it was it was implementing it. It was it was really weird to get that common language down for everybody to have it because it's um, not what you're used to. But year two, it got easier, and then coming into year three, it's you don't even think twice about it now. So now it's just language that everyone in the building uses all day, every day. So as you heard, full implementation takes time <coughs> and it can take over multiple school years. This graphic shows that while PBIS is a structured approach, schools move at their own pace through the various stages. You can see our original schools, some of whom have were at it for the 15, 16 year also, have not reached the innovation and sustainability phase even at the end of last school year. And here are our 19 new schools. No matter the stage of implementation, for our conversations with staff who are currently implementing PBIS at any stage, they shared that it is definitely having an impact on their school culture and the relationships between <coughs> students, teachers, and administrators. You'll hear more later in the presentation about the impact PBIS is having <coughs> at all stages of implementation. But first, let's look at another one of those myths about PBIS. This one is the idea that PBIS is used in place of discipline practices and that students are not to be referred to the office. Now let's hear the reality from an administrator and a teacher who know firsthand that this myth is not true. I can think of several teachers who my first year here at Green Run were very frustrated with some of the discipline that they were experiencing in their classroom. And I think that you know sometimes PBIS has this uh, some skeptics might say that it is uh, a way to, you know, pat kids on the back and only reward positive behavior. But here at Green Run, we've done a lot more with PBIS. We've had a, a lot of teachers who have really begun to see how they can use those expectations for students in order to help manage the behaviors in the classroom in positive ways. In terms of me as a teacher, it's completely revolutionized my classroom management and completely changed my classroom. Um, I've always been a teacher who believes in having a positive, happy place where students have fun and where they want to be, but PBIS has really helped me uh, formalize that type of a classroom. It's not just a silly jumping around place. It's very structured, but it's structured with positivity. My students come in and they're happy to be here because they know they're going to get that encouragement. They know they're going to get love. They know they're going to get that support. Um, it's incredibly reduced any disciplinary incidences that I have. And whenever I do experience a disciplinary incidence, by structuring it through this idea of we are teaching appropriate behaviors, it becomes a teachable moment, which is so much more lasting than just slapping discipline on a student. You know, PBIS still, it, PBIS, PBIS does not mean no discipline, but it does mean that you take the time to teach behaviors, and that is going to be more lasting with students, and it's gonna be more impactful for a relationship between the student and the teacher or the student and administration. So we've heard about some myths, but let's take a look at the impacts of PBIS. So why invest the time? Because PBIS really can help create safe and consistent environments for students and teachers. Let's hear from our schools about the impact PBIS has had, no matter which stage of implementation. The relationships that we've had with our kids has always been great um, because that's the forefront of our focus as teachers. But when we've taken PBIS and we've been able to implement those positive strategies and what's been really nice about PBIS is they've given us these a toolbox per se of these strategies to use throughout the entire building and it's really helped with our kids feeling like they're safe our kids feeling like they're loved and you know our kids recognize that we approach them in a positive aspect and we praise their positive behaviors and we praise the positive things that are happening with them and it's encouraging them and it's encouraging them to perform better not only behaviorally but it's really encouraging them to be more successful academically. The social emotional piece, I think the biggest thing is that our kids feel connected. I think that especially for kids that uh, may be having some difficulty in, uh, in the home life, um, you know, when they come to us, ultimately, you know, it's allowing us an opportunity, a platform, a structured framework to really engage in some dialogue with our kids, um, really to get to know them a lot better, uh, to have a better sense of understanding about the issues, the challenges that they're being presented at home, some of the impacts that some of that behavior may be you know, brought into our building, um, and it's allowing for our staff to be much more understanding 
about some of those some of those needs and it's allowing for our staff to be much more responsive. So now here at Woodstock talking about the Woodstock way has become second nature. It's something our children expect us to talk about every day on the announcements and they wonder what's going on when we don't talk about it on the announcements like why wasn't there a Woodstock way goal today? Well and then so our students are looking forward to hearing um, about the Woodstock way and who is showing the Woodstock way um, each day. Um, it is such a part of our daily conversation that it's part of our our learning targets, it's part of our morning announcements, it's part of our everyday conversation with students. And that has taken some time, but at the same time we're starting to see um, that be very beneficial for all of our students. So as you heard articulated in the accounts from both the teacher and the administra administrative <coughs> perspective, PBIS is having an impact on their schools. So it's helping build relationships between staff and students, allowing students to feel connected and for teachers to be responsive and students to have very clear expectations around their behavior. As schools continue their PBIS journey, they are finding that the benefits and impact in their schools is showing in their data. Let's take a look at some data points from Corporate Landing Elementary Schools currently in the third year of their PBIS journey. Corporate Landing Elementary School has found that in their two years of implementation, negative behaviors resulting in referrals to the office have decreased. Furthermore, their academic data shows increases to the prior year. To wrap up this portion of the presentation about PBIS in our schools, I'd like to share some final thoughts from staff who articulated in their discussions with us countless examples of how PBIS not only assists them in meeting student social emotional needs in service of Compass 2020 Goal 3, but that the impacts of PBIS and that structure in preparing students for life beyond the K-12 experience have really been clearly evident. <coughs> You know, what's been nice about it is that it's not just teachers and it's just not the staff and it's not the front desk because, you know, it's the parents. And so what's been nice about this is that, you know, it, it's gone from just being in our school to going into our community. And so our parents are taking what we call the Woodstock way, which is our matrix, you know, about being safe, being responsible, um, being respectful, and they're using it at home, you know. So our, you'll hear our parents say, well, we asked our kid today, well, were you respectful, were you responsible? You know, what you did at home, was it safe? You know, at the bus stop, was it safe? And so it's nice to see that it's permeated, you know, into our community as well. And so now we have our parent support and our parents have started to see the impact that it's had on their child as a whole, both academically and behaviorally. And whether students are moving into the work world or they're going into a collegiate setting, there has to be accountability and responsibility. And we're providing our students the opportunity to acknowledge good behavior, to set standards. And the students hold the teachers to these standards too, which is really amazing. Um, you know, and in my classroom, we have a, a couple different things that count for professionalism. And it's really funny to see that if I forget something, a student will, you know, joke with me, but say, Ms. Eccles, you know, hey, are you being professional? You know, are you being prepared? And it's great because we can chuckle about it, but I'm like, you know what, you're right, I need to adjust that or you need to adjust that. Um, so it's really created and sparked some great conversation that can be used outside of the high school classroom. Presentation, you've heard how the division is leveraging the student response team process, the mediation practice, in all of our schools and that we're beginning to implement PBIS across the division in support of goal three. So how might we know if we're measuring up to the task of fostering social and emotional development for students? One way is to reflect on some of the data sets within our climate survey. So as reported in the 2017 school division climate survey, there's a high level of agreement among parents that Virginia Beach City Public Schools are safe and orderly places for learning and that our teachers care about how their child does in school. Similarly, teachers agree that BBCPS staff want students to do well. Division wide, our parents and students had high approval ratings for our discipline and school safety. 91% of students said they knew the consequences to their actions in school, and 97% of parents <coughs> and their children know the consequences to their actions. In looking at staff responses, more than two-thirds of our staff members across the division reported the same, and 57% reported that the consequences for breaking the rules are the same for all students in their school. 
In comparison to the student and parent perception data, the teacher data is less favorable. That may be in part because we're asking staff to think about discipline differently. The data also point to why we must continue to implement structures like PBIS across all of our schools so that we can open dialogue around discipline and work towards ensuring consistency and understanding across student, parent, teacher, and administrator groups. As you heard firsthand from our PBIS schools, there are often misconceptions that arise. PBIS is a process and it involves dialogue, conversation and shared consensus around discipline expectations within a school. If we consider organizational change theory, we know that it might take three to five years to see change. And so we have the expectation that our discipline data may really begin to shift like we saw in Corporate Landing Elementary School's example over the next two to three years. In fact, on a previous slide, I showed you how at Corporate Landing Elementary School, the number of negative behaviors that were requiring office referrals declined while they saw an increase in academic data. Now let's also look at the Corporate Landing Elementary School climate survey data for the same items shown on the current slide for the division. You can see that the staff at Corporate Landing Elementary report much higher levels agreement or strong agreement to the same statements around students knowing consequences for misbehaving as well as consequences being the same for all students when breaking the rules. Recall that the division data points for the same items were 69% and 57% respectively. So clearly this work is important. It requires patience and persistence and it's a multi-year process to get to full implementation. As the division continues with PBIS implementation, central staff are committed to working to ensure a clear message going forward that this work is designed to meet the social and emotional needs of students as stated in goal three, but it does not replace our student code of conduct and discipline guidelines, which continue to be in full effect. Now let's take a look at some division referral and suspension data. Here you can see the past three years. Our referral data has not changed much over time. Year to year data shows that there were some, dro some drops in referrals, but it was not a significant drop. So in 2014, we had 28,959 referrals and this past school year, we had 28,413, a decrease of less than 2%. The suspension data is similar as well. The intention is that the open dialogue as part of the SRT process, mediation when appropriate, and the implementation of the PBIS framework is that this will lay the foundation for some long-term changes, resulting in the reduction of student problem behaviors, which may in turn lead to fewer discipline referrals, and that the teaching of self-discipline and the focus on positive behavioral expectations will continue to foster the social and emotional needs of our students. Again, the key is to ultimately reduce the incidence of problem behaviors with students. And it's these behaviors which can disrupt learning and may ultimately result in discipline referrals. To end, I'd like to um, first provide the board a one-page document that has an overview <coughs> of all the concepts we covered in the presentation. Um, and that are covered within the slides in case that's something that may be handy for you. It, it does um, cover some of the information in the presentation. And I'd also um, especially like to thank the schools who shared their stories on camera for the board tonight. Um, and I'd also like to recognize some staff from Student Support Services and other offices within the Department of Teaching and Learning who have been instrumental um, in both the SRT work, mediation work, and PBIS work. So if they could please be stand to, stand to be recognized. Um, Dr. Lakeish Parrott um, in Office of Opportunity and Achievement along with Bobby Jamison have been working tirelessly on mediation along with the school counselors and administrators in our buildings. Um, we also have Karen DiMaggio and some of our PBIS coaches who have been leading the charge with PBIS for the schools who have been on board and will continue to come on board. And remember, we have an awful lot of schools who have yet to even begin the PBIS work. So they're really working with our current schools 
um, and, and getting best practices and getting ready to support schools moving forward. And Adrian Day has been working to oversee the SRT process for our schools and support them and making sure that they have their teams up and running and have the support they need for the school year. So thank you to all of you for your work. We will now, or I will take questions, or if you want to ask specific questions of the team as well. Do any board members have questions? <laughs> okay, so I took away from this um, universal language, which is so important. That's, so we've had 19 this year. So where will this go next year? By 2020, everyone will be on board. So cohorts of about the same size um, need to come on board over the next two school years so that everyone can begin to engage in these conversations with the support of PBIS coaches, which are staff um, in our Office of Psychological Services who are able to dedicate some time to helping facilitate that work because it, it does take some time and facilitation. Ms. Manning. Um, so, I studied positive behavioral <laughs> interventions in college. I used it with my own sons. Um, I saw pretty much every teacher my kids have ever had in Virginia Beach has used PBIS, although I think it's labeled now. It wasn't necessarily labeled before. So um, I'm a huge advocate of positive behavioral reinforcement. I think it's extremely important, but I I really think a lot of our teachers do that already. I'm not saying that there aren't teachers that don't, but I would like to give credit to those teachers because they really do. Um, I've seen it firsthand numerous times. Um, but what I what I think has been misunderstood perhaps, <coughs> because, you know, I've, I've heard over and over that it wasn't the intention mm -hmm. um, from federal laws, state laws that have come down that says you must, you must reduce referrals and, and suspensions. Right. Teachers and administrators have heard, okay, I can't refer. And I still think that's a big problem. And if that's the case, then we need to make it very clear to teachers that, that, that you can refer students and that you're going to be supported when you do refer students. Yes. So where are we with so, that in making sure that teachers know that so they can? Two points to what one is, um, you're right, a lot of teachers are using these strategies and they're great teaching practices. What the PBI <coughs> does is allow a school to develop a common language or matrix across the school so there's consistency from classroom to classroom. So the way teacher A is implementing that positive language might be a little different than teacher B. So we heard a great example of how once the school begins using some common language, and this is shared decision making, teachers have a voice in this and bring forward their best practices and determine what it may look like in the school. So absolutely, um, we recognize great examples, school to school, schools who aren't even um, engaged in PBIS where that's the focus. Um, and, and then I would say, as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, knowing that those misconceptions um, can arise, particularly not just to speak to the work of PBIS, as you mentioned, or mediation or SRT, um, but to um, other pressures or factors outside of the school division, we are committed as we move forward to making that message very clear. And so, you know, when we look at that climate survey data and those staff responses that weren't as strong, weren't as strong, um, that's a message message to us that we need to make sure we have consistent language. And that's part of what PBIS and opening that dialogue um, across a whole faculty that involves the administration and involves teachers can help us get there. So well, I think it's just important to add on to that, that a um, couple of things. So one, uh, I, I sent you all an update, I think at the beginning of the year, uh, a video, a town hall that we did with teachers to really sort of tackle this question mm -hmm. and talk about it. And so if you hadn't had the chance to see that and you'd like to see that, I'll make sure I send that link back to you. And that was shared with all staff across the division to sort of provide a consistent message about what the expectation is in terms of the discipline process. And really the, the key message there was that the discipline process is you know, two rails of the same track, that there is a, a, a consequence side to that, but that can't be the only side to that, that there also has to be a teaching side to that um, so that we can teach positive self-discipline, so that we can teach making better decisions, so that as students go down the road, they find themselves um, behaving more and more appropriately. Um, I think the key message for us and from our perspective is that the more we do this work, we want to see a reduction in, be in behaviors, which will ultimately lead to a reduction in referrals. So it's not reduce referrals by not referring, it's reduced behaviors, which down the road ought to lead to a reduction in referrals. Um, and then I think the last piece of that, as you get questions about this in the community, is just go back to that, that data slide that says, well, I mean, I hear you, except that 
the referral numbers haven't changed. They just haven't changed over time. And so the what what what's happening might be isolated to a particular school or to a particular administrator and teacher. And so then as as we talked about last time, just referring them back to the administration and saying, okay, let's have some dialogue about that at the administrative level. And if they're not satisfied with what they're hearing at the school level, to then take it to the Office of School Leadership to have some dialogue around that so that if we have the specifics of where that's isolated, we can go and have a conversation uh, with the leadership at that school to make sure we're reinforcing the message that we've communicated at the division <coughs> level. Um, because, I mean, I have to suspect it's got to be an isolated thing because the data just doesn't bear out that referrals have dropped dramatically. They just haven't. And so um, I, I, I would definitely encourage if you're hearing that, um, Ms. Manning in particular, uh, based on your question, um, you know, send them back to the school or if you know a particular school that a teacher's at and you want to just talk to us about that, we can go back and we can talk to the um, to the leadership at that school and try to understand what's happening there and make sure that it's very clear in the building what our expectations are in terms of the process. Well, it's not just what I'm hearing. It's the teacher climate surveys as well indicated that. So I, I think it's, it's way more than just what I'm hearing. Well, I don't know that the climate survey specifically indicated that they don't know that they can refer. I think the lowest data from the teachers was that they're not sure students understand the consequences. And I mean, I would posit it's just a matter of us being in the in the uh, process of having these conversations that may have caused some confusion. And so we have tried, as I said, we've, you know, the, the, the video we sent out and then the conversations that we're having through this kind of ongoing effort to implement PBIS, I think will over time have a, have a positive impact on that. Ms. Williams? <clears throat> yeah, I, mean, I, I do agree that a lot of it has to do with how the leader of the building um, when they talk to their teachers and everything, that it comes from the from the administrators and principals. So we want to make sure that that's consistent. Um, PBIS is yeah, like I parent and like I coach, you know, at the collegiate level. Um, but I'm just kind of wondering, and you know, maybe I've been just extra lucky. I've had my kids in school for 32 straight years without a break, <coughs> and a grandchild. But yeah, I'm thinking they're doing this, you know, anyway. I mean. Um, and my other thing is, are they not teaching this at, at the at the collegiate level, at the college level, or, or is this like a, well, are they not teaching this? Well, I would say one thing um, about the fact that PBIS kind of is happening anyway. Some of the strategies within <coughs> PBIS are happening around positive classroom <coughs> management. So a teacher may learn in their prep program how to set up a behavioral <coughs> system that's right. focused on positive with you know, um, rewarding that and setting up consequences. But that that larger PBIS framework puts some processes in that are school-wide and are agreed upon across the school. <coughs> For example, there's a very heavy emphasis on data. There's a PBIS team that looks at where are um, instances happening within the building and are there, are there particular time frames? For example, um, a building may notice, you know, at a particular high school, their PBIS team may be looking at that and saying, you know, we're getting a large number of office referrals between this time and this time on this hallway. You know, there's an unsupervised bathroom here. What can we do to help, um, you know, create a situation so there are less problem behaviors there? So it's a little bit more than just practice teacher to teacher. It's kind of mobilizing um, a structure that the whole school can use and putting a team in place to monitor that and ensuring some commonality, um, again, from classroom to classroom across the school, um, and then setting up expectations um, really in a clear way that even parents can understand it helps you know throughout that entire experience we heard a great example I think from Woodstock where or actually it was Salem Elementary where she said the start of the school year was smoother because um, the kids began to get used to that language and then one of the Woodstock um, teachers was sharing the parents can say when their behavior things at home they're using are we respectful um, are we safe knowing that Woodstock way and that language and latching on to that so I think yes, positive um, behavior um, classroom incentive programs are absolutely something our teachers typically come with a good understanding of, and then that really helps um, when they begin the work as a school. And so, um, and, and so I can understand how, of course, the SRT is is a is a great tier. Um, um, process for academic success and, and the PBIS. So those are kind of like embedded, but with this mediation, are we using mediators within our own school system? Because years ago, actually, one of my kids um, had a mediator and they came from Richmond. 
And I was like, why are we paying somebody from Richmond to come and mediate this? And so, so, and when does that take place? Does it take place in instructional time? Is it a one-time thing? Is it a three or four? Are we, are we bringing mediators in from different cities? No, these would be our own staff. So typically the school counselor within the building would be the person conducting the mediation. It could be there are other staff that have been trained in the building. Um, so it's no, it's leveraging the own, your own support staff within a school. Okay, and so good, as good. to the number of times it might take place, it would it would depend on the instance. Um, and again, mediation's been used. It's been part right. of, as I said, our code of conduct. Oh, and fine. what we found <laughs> is it's a really powerful practice. And you might recall on the Student Discipline Task Force when they did their work, one of their recommendations was to make sure we were leveraging mediation appropriately in our schools. And so while it was listed there, we found um, school to school, they didn't really know how to mobilize that or they didn't have the training to pull it off. Um, and they weren't sure specifically how they might leverage that practice when a student and teacher relationship needed repair. So there was a discipline instance in class, a student might be suspended out of class, but then they're going to return. And so when the student returns, might there, <coughs> would mediation be appropriate? It would depend on the circumstance between the student and teacher, for example, to help repair that relationship and set them up for success upon a student's return. Um, it might be student to student mediation, which has typically been more common over the years. Um, our school counselors have been well equipped to deal with that. Um, and are the parents notified that their child is going through this yes. mediation and are they invited to participate if appropriate? I mean, if it were appropriate, I'm sure, they, sure there could be a situation where they were involved in the mediation, but they're absolutely made aware, um, just as they would be if a child was referred to the <coughs> office or a counselor for anything else. Our counselors do make contact. Mm -hmm. Ms. Yes. Ms. Holtz. Thank you. Uh, it would be helpful to me if you gave more examples of how the teams are used, but you actually did give one a minute ago about trouble in a particular spot. But what I was thinking about, say in middle school, two kids had a fist fight. Well, we know that there's discipline already in place for that. Right. But say a, a child was being bullied and that could lead to an altercation. If, if that child went up and spoke to the teacher, would, would, the, would the team come into play? Would you have a student response team? To, to mediate that, or how would you handle that? Well, student response teams can be used for a number of reasons. A child might be having academic difficulty, behavior difficulty. It might stem from peer relations where a teacher right. or a parent might make the referral, and that team would work on putting strategies or interventions into place. Mediation might be one of those strategies, but it might operate separately without ever ha having enacted a student response team. It might be that there are two students who um, like you gave a fist fight example, they've had that, they've had their consequences in the office, they've been disciplined, but um, the administration might note that there's an ongoing feud here and there right. might be an opportunity if parties are willing, both parties are willing to engage in um, mediation with the school counselor, for example, to help again restore and repair the relationship to hopefully um, get to the bottom of it so that there's not a repeat incident. So it's, it's, it's having the folks who are involved with our students, whether it's the teacher, whether it's the school administrator who's doling out the discipline or dealing with the referrals, to have them look at those scenarios and situations and say, is this um, a situation where mediation could help restore a relationship, could help get to the root cause of a problem, um, you know, that there's clearly something else. Oftentimes students may act out in class, there's a referral, they're in the office, but it's clear there's something underlying that may be more than meets the eye. Mediation's one way to get to that. So it really is situational and that's a lot of what we did um, in the training with our administrators and counselors was talking through when, when does it make sense and when does it clearly not make sense and when is it not appropriate. Thank Ms. Riggs. So I would think that, I mean, when um, the Woodstock teacher was talking, she was talking about the parent saying, you know, mm -hmm. they're using some of the same language. And I know when I went to the, <clears throat> what do you call it, your expo we had, you had at, um, down at the uh, convention center. One yeah, of the, the navigating the journey. Yeah, one oh, yeah. of the um, one of the areas that you had of interest was the PBIS and, and the, the people back there. So how much, and I know probably parent connection, how much of this is being shared with parents um, in, in ways that they can do this at their own, you know, in home? Because I think that's where we're seeing a lot of problems this day and time is 
parents not knowing how to work with their own children and, and knowing how to use that. I mean, I know we can't call the shots on the homes, but how much of it are they sharing this, like at the PTA open houses? For How much? schools engaged in PBIS, they have a plan for parent or community engagement. And so it may look like letters, it may be um, kickoff assemblies at back to school night or open house. There may be a video introduction to parent, parents about what their school wide um, matrices is. So um, certainly for those schools, yes. But remember, we have a lot of schools not on board yet. Yeah. So we are trying to make sure they're that we're um, dispelling some misconceptions there to answer questions, and that's one reason um, we opted to have that featured at our Navigating the Journey Night. But yeah, this is about um, the community and parents as well. So the schools that are engaged in the work absolutely have a plan for what, what will meet their parent needs. Thank you, Dr. Castwell. This has been extremely informative. Yes, um, thank you. Very good. Ms. Rye, and, and then and we need to be mindful of the time. Thank you. Quick. Quickly, yes, the role of counselors, I just wanted to trace back to Dr. Robertson and his department and their, their recommendation <coughs> when the report was presented a few months ago for uh, more counseling support, or support in terms of staffing, which I fully support. And this is one of the reasons uh, so that our counselors can do actual counseling and mediation, and it all sounds great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caswell. Okay, we are uh, in recess at this point until 6 o'clock from the dais. Mm -hmm.